had other supervisors, so keep it being nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we're not stuffing this session um, to, to keep your grades up at all. No, that's fine. Um, so uh, I'll just explain this heading. Um, uh, uh, Throat has been talking to me about running this, this session uh, for a very long time. I said, oh, look, I'm, I'm so... I, uh, I just can't think about what I'm going to give, and he just kept nagging me and nagging me, and in, in the end, he went to press with the with the title uh, "Throat Supervisor," uh, Leslie Carr, Throat Supervisor. So he's allowed to be late for this heading, and I thought that was a perfect title for uh, what I wanted to say because it really sums up what we've been saying about you know, uh, if the if the heading is future of text, we're just terribly late for it, and I. And so what I wanted to talk about was, you know, sort of that, that feeling. Um, and I, what I want to do, um, so Wendy and others here have, have focused on big pictures. I just want to sort of uh, just really shrink down to a sort of very small issue that affects me um, personally as an academic. I was very pleased uh, Dave started off with a picture uh, and talking about literary machines. Oh, I was going to reference that. And, <laughs> 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 um, but, um, and so, you know, we start with this, uh, this notion, um, and I'll start with the notion um, f that we've lived with forever, that, that these machines, that our infrastructure, our technical infrastructure, can help us with our literature. Um, the, the idea of literary text, of literature, is very familiar to, um, to people in universities. We refer to the literature. We mean, we self-consciously mean a very, very large, you know, sort of hundreds of millions of documents that are interconnected with each other. This is where, you know, sort of we're, we're very au fait with the ideas of hypertext. And what's happened is our literary machines have helped us to write these texts the incredible complexities and, and all of the nitty-gritty detail that comes in trying to, to sort of self-typeset and self-edit and lay out uh, and apply, uh, you know, apply style rules and to create uh, reference lists according to particular sets of rules. Um, we have become very good at doing this ourselves when it is only a few decades ago that other people would do it for us. Uh, and we would give them, you know, sort of manuscripts. Uh, but we've taken on this job with our literary machines, and that's great. And also what has happened is these literary machines have worked at scale to help us try to analyse or display or come to terms with, in some way, the mass, the, the large picture of how all of this works together. So these are... These are visualizations of the citation network or the authorship network that come when you uh, being in, you know, in, in possession of all the world's literature. You know, if you're, uh, if you're um, the, the um, uh, Scopus and, you, and you're part of Elsevier, or if, you're, um, or if you have all of the metadata from established business processes going back, going back many decades, you can you can produce these large-scale um, uh, visualizations of how scholarship works together and networks together. Um, and this, for example, up here is something from SciVal, which is offered to all universities. This is all British research over the last five years. And the, 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 um, <coughs> the names around the edges of the circles are different disciplines. And then the, these are clusters of disciplines uh, and how they all collaborate together, and how they and how they are interdisciplinary, and that is embarrassing. Sorry, uh, and how they work together um, uh, uh, across disciplines. Now, the problem is, you know, sort of, you know, what is an individual scholarly contribution? You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Often imagine, you, you often imagine someone standing on a giant shoulder. That the giant is usually a man, but that's uh, never mind that. It's much more like this, where groups of us collaborate together to, you know, sort of to provide a basis for us, uh, and to, to climb on top of each other's research and working together. So we're all we're all collaborating. There's huge amounts of it. We do we play a little part of it, and understanding how our individual contribution work is the problem. So I've just been working with some, with Frode and others, just to look, try to understand 
how we as writers and how I as a reader can understand how someone as a writer has knitted, knit, mat, I'm uh, just sure the past well, participle in English, um, and together their, their own <coughs> literary contribution with these tens of millions of things. So um, I regularly have to uh, examine PhD students. This is a PhD thesis, um, Dave mentioned it. It tells a story, okay? This, these are all the citations that go along. This is the, the, the number of pages through the, through the thesis. And you can see that there's a long stream of citations, a sudden break, and then there's some more. That sudden break is the point at which the PhD candidate is explaining their own work and not referring to anything else anyone else has done. They're just uh, dealing with their own data and their own analysis. Beforehand, you've got a literature review, you've got a small methodology section, that's that little uptick there, and then unusually, uh, and if I were the examiner I'd want to sort of find out about this, once we get to the discussion and conclusions we're suddenly starting to bring in a whole new lot of literature again. So I'm thinking, oh well that's interesting, what's going on here? And what I can see as well, there's a set of appendices where a large body of extra literature review has been put in because we've got a lot of uh, other citations there. Uh, and, and I understand something about the whole structure of this engagement from just this little this thumbprint. And I've done this on a number of, of theses, and they give... It gives an interesting background into what I'm reading, how the story's been developed, and how it's been knitted into this uh, enormous um, hypertext of uh, this multi-literature that, that, that we have. Um, there are other ways to look at this. You could do a network analysis of all the ones that are close together, all of the citations that appear close together, and see how these, how these things tend to cluster in the document independently, perhaps, of you know, just saying, oh, look, we've got this, we've got this table of context, we've got this gross sort of chapter structure. Um, and you could, so this gives another way of saying, well, these, are, these all relate to each other, but not really to anything else, whereas this seems to be a much more central set of ideas that are, that are more important, that are better knitted in. So, again, it just helps me as a reader... And that's what we've been less good at, I think. Um, because, uh, so the title of this slide, but no simpler, I, uh, I was inspired by the, um, uh, by, by your, your title, um, uh, If I Can't Inspire Love, you know, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And this is, you know, this is a quote that's attributed to Einstein, of course, which is, you know, things should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. We've pushed some really simple ideas, and there are some ideas that we haven't pushed. You know, we really still don't know how to support people understanding networks. Most of what we do is presented as lists. Why is everything a list? Why is everything reduced? Even our social networks just look like email. You know, why? There's huge, rich networks we need to make better ways of understanding networks of text, but that's no uh, news to you, I guess. So perhaps uh, old news or fake news. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> we just saw a great example of a different kind of view of the... We're talking about this for at least half of the day. There's going to be some questions or suggestions. Yes, Adam. So I'd like to sort of just continue with like what would possible next next generation metaphors be for um, the organizing and manipulation of information. Um, I mean network what network is, is is tricky for reasons that it's understanding multiple links and associations is just is just hard for people. Right? Mm -hmm. It's um, it's not that maybe yeah. a visualization where it can help me visualize lots of neural networks in you know three D space and VR and they're not fundamentally simpler than they are in 2D. Mm -hmm. That said, though, there are some things that, when done in space, are super intuitive. And they're, they're the metaphors we try to copy in a, in a desktop environment with, you know, we use these relations all the time. But, um, I mean, for example, in programming, if 
we, we to toyed with composing a sort of visual programming language yes, where a branch program. statement is yes. physically moving into another dimension, yes. loops stay in the same plane, and there's an element where I wish I'd grown up in a world where my abstract symbols existed in this three-dimensional environment because I'd probably be way better at doing mm -hmm. things. But it takes a lot of training. Mm -hmm. I would, at least I haven't gone there yet. I would love to see your brains about what what things what things you would like to try if you're even all the research. Oh, well, that's the, that, that's his PhD. That, okay. I'm just pushing that onto him. <laughs> um, so I think it's very interesting that the way that that, that um, children are being taught to program now is in a visual way, in a visual metaphor, <coughs> you know, sort of enforcing that layout, enforcing their understanding. Um, and I think that one of the problems with networks is we are just satisfied with poor network visualisation. We're satisfied with pretty broccoli diagrams yeah. and we go, oh, and we aren't taught how to interpret those and go, well, that's exactly what you'd expect, you know, so... Um, yeah, I completely agree. Perhaps it will be another 50 years before we're... But to elaborate on that, if, if I may. Okay, yes, right. um, yes I, would, I would say interactivity is the key to that. Everybody's desk is a mess, right? And it does, papers do change, even though there are some spatial orientations. <coughs> but if we build interactivity, you know, that is fluid enough to allow you to build these spaces, something can come out of it. I would go so far as to say the most basic part of the universe is not information, it is interaction. So I just want to big up interaction all the time. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure... Um, oh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about something else. Okay. There seems to be sort of two forces at play today. So David was talking about how we're so time poor, so we're trying to come up with solutions to overcome being time poor. And then we've seen a lot of solutions today, like sort of the, the summaries of text, and we see here the visualizations of text. Um, and it, it's almost in the future of text, we're actually going to substitute sitting down and with a coffee and actually reading and learning. Do you think there's a risk of that kind of, will there ever be a substitute for that? Oh, God, no. You, know, you use the word substitute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, 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 we no, know no, each other. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not making it deliberately yeah. competitive. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not making accusation. No, no, no. no. So, but the, the, the so word I'm substitute is the. Is the Yes, 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 so that not my cup of coffee, but my cup of old grey, thank you very much, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, then um, I want to be able to have better ways into a faster understanding, a deeper understanding of what yeah. this text is about, rather than just counting up the number of citations and after going, oh, you've got about 150, you can have a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, not that I've ever done that. That would be <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I'm not taking notes. Uh, right. Um, Okay. No, 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 no. There's going to be some more combat on this one. Yes, uh, <laughs> Professor, Mark Nix Professor Mark Nixon is said to have uh, told his PhD students, oh, forget all the references, just tell me what you did. Yeah. And so the, his thesis from his group were about <coughs> half the length of everybody else's, mm -hmm. and they passed. Wow. <laughs> Can I pass? <laughs> no, well, well, that's a painful. I, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, it would be entirely unprofessional of me to pick on the particular examples, in, uh, but I, I think, you know, as part of a PhD, it is very clear you have to show you that you are rooted in a, a clear understanding of all of the knowledge in a particular area and the gaps of that knowledge, and you have to demonstrate that. How you demonstrate that is up to you. Thank um, you very much. Thank you.